Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 28. As you're turning there, we've, we've come in our studies of these exercises for biblical health, the disciplines, the training that were taught by Paul to Timothy for the early church. We've come now to the central uh, element, the central discipline, which uh, happens to also be our job descriptions. Uh, if you've ever been hired for any type of job and you wanted to retain that job, you carefully tried to find out what was expected from you and you tried to excel in that area uh, because you wanted, if it's a job you wanted, of course, if you didn't want it, you didn't do it. Uh, this is our job description. This is what the Lord crystallizes down as our purpose for being left here on earth. When God saved us, the reason he didn't evacuate us to heaven is, he says, I've left you here for a singular purpose, to go into all the world and make disciples. And the discipline of disciple-making is a choice we make in life. What is the choice? To turn everything in our life toward this singular purpose of our existence on earth. We glorify God when we do what he created us to do. He created us in Christ to make disciples. That's why we're here. Uh, we're not here to, to accumulate stuff. The longer you live, the harder it is. You have to start getting rid of it. We're not here merely to make money. You need money to live. That's not why we're here. We're not here for the most comfortable, well-adjusted lifestyle to, to live as long as possible, as comfortably and healthy as possible. We're here to make disciples. And once you see that, no matter where we are, that's, that, that is the blessed privilege we have in life. It brings us to a question. Are we doing what Christ left us to do? This morning, is everything in your life and in my life somehow tied to my job description as a Christian? Matthew 28 has that job description. And let's go through that this morning because we've come to our very own personal job description left by Christ as the reason he saved us, starting in verse 18 of chapter 28. He, he left us here to serve him through life making disciples. And the question is, are we doing, and more personally, am I doing what God through Christ, left me to do. God has always desired to be glorified by reaching the world with his message of love. God wants us telling people about his forgiveness of sin. God wants us to offer his reconciliation leading to eternal life. You and I are dispensers of reconciliation. We know about it. We can dispense it. It's kind of like a doctor who can write prescriptions. You and I have the inside track knowing how reconciliation which is being made right with God, no longer enemies, recip recipients of his grace. We know how that happens. They don't. Lost people don't understand that. And God has left us to be ministers of his reconciliation, which leads to eternal life. God is not willing that any should perish. So God has always desired that the world hear his message, that they need to repent, that they might be saved. Now, why? Well, the reason is because God is a Savior. Did you know there's a unifying, a lot of people are always searching for some mystical theme that will fit together the Bible. If you just plainly read it, as soon as mankind fell into sin, as soon as Adam and Eve departed from God's way, who came looking for them? God the Savior. Chapter 3, God says, where art thou in Genesis in the New, that's the whole Old Testament, God coming and seeking a lost world. And he, he sought them through Noah. He sought them through his chosen people of promise, the Jewish people. They wouldn't do it, so he replaced them, temporarily setting them aside with a current us, the church, also to minister as reconciliation. But by the way, the, the Jews are coming back. They're the stars of the tribulation. From chapter 7 through chapter 14 in Revelation, they are the evangelists of the world. But God is a savior. God had Noah preach for 100 years. God established Israel as a light to the nations. But they mostly refused, so he set them aside temporarily. God has, for the past 2,000 years, worked through us, his church, to spread his message. God has future plans. In Revelation, we see those. But God has always been glorified through people who would witness and proclaim the message of salvation. God is a savior. 
He wants us to do that. That's what glorifies him. At this moment, God is working his plan of redemption through us, his church. In the Old Testament, God clearly laid down his plans for Israel. By the time we get to Deuteronomy, God says, Cling to me, the Lord. Love me, your Lord. Serve me, your Lord. And through your love, love outsiders. They were to share God with outsiders. That's why they built that tent and that temple. They were supposed to be a magnet. People were supposed to see God's rich blessing on them, wonder why they were so wonderfully blessed, and they would bring them to see and learn about and understand the God who is a Savior. But Israel wasn't interested in that. They sadly disregarded that calling and commission So God temporarily sets them aside. So that's where we get to the New Testament. God opens the New Testament, and even more clearly than he told Israel in the Old Testament, he tells the church right here, right as the church is being launched, right as this first generation of the leaders of his church are being sent out, he hands them their marching orders, their job description. And they are to go throughout the whole world teaching and leading others into becoming followers of Jesus Christ, disciple makers. And he crystallizes that message right here. In the power of the resurrection in verse 18, as the leaders of the first generation of the church in verse 19, they were given his clear commission. And this chapter, Matthew 28, is such an amazing linkage of the Old and the New Testament to God the Savior wanting his people to proclaim that truth. We're just continuing in what he has always wanted done. The Savior's plan given to Israel and ignored is now given to his church and the magnitude of these words has never diminished. I mean, it is so singularly focused that you can go through life No matter what you do, no matter where you live, whether, I mean, I grew up in a factory worker's home. My dad worked in the same building for 46 years, doing the same thing for 46 years. But he knew that wasn't what he lived for. He was the biggest purveyor of Christian literature in General Motors. I mean, he would bring in his lunchbox packed with material. And when all those men had their mandatory union-mandated breaks, and when they'd run out of every other thing to talk about, he'd say, there's... You know, could I talk about something? They go, oh, sure, we have nothing else to talk about. We have to sit here for 20 minutes or however long the break was. And he would share Christ. He knew that he was here for a purpose. He had to work at Oldsmobile, but he was here for a purpose. It's crystallized right here. The clearest marching orders for every believer alive today. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, is the distillation of all Jesus was doing in his earthly ministry as recorded in the gospel. The Gospels are Jesus discipling 12 men. One drops out. 11 men meet him on the mountain, and he commissions them to do what he trained them to do. And he said, and that's what you're supposed to train every succeeding generation to do. And by the way, the the book of Acts is a continuation of that, and the epistles are examples and exclamations of the great commission to the church, and Revelation is the finish of the church's term of service, the return of Israel to active duty, and God's plans and expectations are stated in this commissioning job description. So, Matthew 28 18 to 20. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. I'm going to put it on the screen because I want you to see the main verb. I bolded it for you. This is the verb. All the other verb forms are participles that are pointing toward the central purpose of every believer. If you're saved this morning, this is your and my job description. And this is what Jesus says. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that your Spirit, working within us, would quicken our hearts, our understandings, our minds to the truth of what you left us to do, what your expectations are of our time investment, 
while we pass our days awaiting being reunited with you and serving you forever in heaven, what you are going to ask us about at the judgment seat of Christ is simply, did you do what I left you to do? Did you point every part of your life for all of your days toward making disciples? It's so simple. It's so clear. It's so focused. And we're not often. And I pray that today might be a sharpening of our focus on what you left us here to do. And considering and pondering how we can adjust and turn every facet of our life to focus on making disciples, followers, those who love and serve and follow you, O Christ. May we be those followers first and foremost before we try and talk to anybody else. And then may we focus our lives on as many people as possible, exposing them to the ministry of reconciliation until you come or call for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, this is a, a graphic. If your English teacher was outlining this passage of Scripture, she would have reminded you of these things because the key that unlocks what God has left us here on earth after salvation for is right in verse 19. When Jesus said, make disciples, those words were carefully engineered by the Holy Spirit to explain the focus of every day of our life if we want to please God. If you want to please God, you have to be involved in making disciples. If you're not involved with making disciples, you're not pleasing God. Because he said, this is what I want you to do. And when we choose to not do that, it doesn't please him. It's such a simple way of life. All the verbs are in this passage are, are participles. The going, the teaching, and the baptizing. Long ago in English grammar, we all learned that participles were verb forms that are to modify the main verb. Just as the participle points itself toward the main verb and is attached completely to that main verb, each of our lives are to be attached to the main verb of our existence. We were designed by God to be disciple makers. And we are to discipline and train and focus and choose to do what we were designed to do. I mean, that just simplifies life. We have been placed by God in this world to be making disciples. So we could put it this way. What on earth do we live for? I mean, think about it. What are you living for? Are you living for collecting? Are you living for experiencing? Are you living for enjoying? Are you living for, you know, amassing? What, what are you living for? God says, those are all nice things and people do them, but that's not what you and I were designed and called and saved to live for. In fact, you can, you can outline the whole New Testament. The purpose of the church is to make disciples. He says it here. In the Gospels, Jesus trained his 12 disciples in how to make disciples. Then here at the Great Commission, Jesus charged the disciples as he was leaving for them to connect every point of their life toward making disciples. Everything they did in life was to be focused on the goal of disciple making. The book of Acts is the record of how these men were used by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit to stir up everyone they got near in the church of Christ to be going, to be talking, to be giving, to be living for making disciples. And when discipleship was, was needed in a new place, the people actually, you read the book of Acts, they said, we're going to invest, we're going to invest. We want to be a part of not only making disciples here, but wherever God is at work. And it seems like the whole church all had the same script. I mean, you read the book of Acts, everybody is talking, everybody is going, everybody is doing, everybody is, is continuing from house to house, encouraging one another, saying, how are you doing as a disciple and making disciples? They weren't distracted. The epistles becomes the instruction manual, how to keep the impossible job of disciple-making running smoothly. And what the epistles are about is that only obedient, surrendered, and spirit-filled believers are able to make disciples. You see, the, the, the spirit is grieved, he's quenched, his power doesn't flow when we're not obedient and spirit-filled. And so we don't make disciples. So if you're not making disciples, 
That means that either you're not obedient or you're not spirit-filled. Because if the Holy Spirit fills us, he prompts us to obey what he's asked us to do. Our job description. You know, it's like showing up at work and, and uh, you know, doing something outside, clipping the roses when, when you're supposed to be running the checkout counter and all the customers are lined up and you're saying, well, I'm busy, I'm busy. And they say, yeah, but we hired you to be a clerk over here. See, our job description in life is so focused and so many people aren't focused on the job description. They're just focused on whatever they've chosen as important in their life. And the Lord said, that doesn't please me. By the way, Revelation shows the results. The numberless crowds of disciples are there. They're in heaven. They're surrounding the throne of God the Savior. See, the whole focus of the Bible is God redeeming a people, saving them, that they would worship and glorify him. And so the Bible culminates with the God who came looking for fallen humanity and left all of these witnesses sitting on the throne with all of those disciples, those who were following him and obeying him, worshiping around his throne because of his wonderful message of love, because they experienced his forgiveness of sin, because they accepted his offer of reconciliation that led to eternal life. That's the whole Bible. That's God's plan. God's desire could not be clearer. God's plan for us could not be more simply stated. The Great Commission is learning to focus every part of our life on the main verb of God's plan, making disciples of all the nations, the kindreds, the tongues, the tribes of people. God is glorified when he's proclaimed for who he is, God the Savior. And so, I remember when I was sent out from Grace Community Church many years ago. In fact, I remember it so well. I have it written down. This is what John MacArthur, when, when he trained us who were under his ministry, going out in the pastorate in the 1980s, this is what he told us. The mission of the church is not fellowship. The mission of the church is not teaching or preaching. The mission of the church is not praising and worshiping. These are all functions of the church. They strengthen, they motivate it, they direct it toward the mission of the church, which is to make disciples of all nations, all peoples, all races, all tribes, all ethnic groups across the face of the earth. That's the only reason we're here, because every other function of the church would be better accomplished in heaven. I can still hear him saying that. He says, everything we do would be better done in heaven. The fellowship's better, the teaching's better, the truth's better up there. But we're left for the one thing, kind of like the book, the only thing that won't be in heaven, what is that? Evangelism. There's no evangelism in heaven. That's the only thing that, that we are left to do is make disciples. He goes on to say, the reason you're here in this world is so that you might be an instrument by which God can reconcile others to himself. And he used to love to tell the story. I don't know it as well as he does, but he talked about a rescue operation on some coast where there was a dangerous stretch where ships were always crashing and people were drowning and they set up a rescue station there and they trained people to be looking for ships that were in distress and to go out in boats and to pull them in the boats and bring them back and get them all warmed up and save them. And this rescue outfit got so good, it got so much attention that people came and they added on to it and they started putting up memorials to great rescues of the past until finally the whole place started looking inward at all their great rescuers and the ships were all crashing out on the rocks. And they had gone from being a rescue station to a place that extolled rescuing but not doing it. And that's where the church is nowadays. We're talking about everything that's great stuff. We're just not doing it. We talk about it. We don't do it. And I remember 30 years ago him reminding us that salvation is knowing and following Christ. And Jesus Christ said, I left you here to go everywhere for all your life and make sure everything that's in your life, whether you're a slave in the first century working in some master's house or whether you're a leather worker in your shop like Paul or whether you're a fisherman like the apostles began as, he says, I want everything in your life to be focused I'm making disciples. Now, for just a moment, turn to chapter 10 of the Gospel by John. So you're at the end of Matthew. Go to the right, John 10. 
And I, first I want to clarify what we're talking about making disciples. We're not talking about making church members. We're not talking about getting people to sign up for something or pray a prayer or make a decision or get baptized. What we're talking about is what Jesus talked about. Look what it, it says. Salvation is knowing and following Jesus Christ. John 10, 27. Just follow along in your Bible. Underline this in your heart. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Really knowing Jesus Christ leads to really following him. Salvation is knowing Jesus Christ personally, not about him, intimately experiencing him. That's why Jesus talks about communion as eating my flesh, drinking my blood. Eating and drinking are something we can only do for ourselves. You can watch someone all day. You can read about it. You can study it. You can watch videos on it, you know, on, on YouTube and learn how to be better at, at cooking. But if you don't eat, it doesn't do any good. That's why Jesus said you have to personally experience You have to know me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Knowing and following Jesus is the call of every believer, and it's the only assurance of really being a member of his family. Did you know that? This is, this is Jesus uh, talking near the end of his ministry. The next chapter, 11, is the raising of Lazarus, and then we go into the last day of his life. The, the events are, are quickly coming to an end. This is at the end of his ministry, and he says, hey, Knowing and following me is the evidence of being a disciple, of being a, a truly born-again person. Now turn back to Matthew 7. I'll show you how you began his ministry. Matthew 7, 13. I mean, Jesus started off his ministry with a bang. At the start of his public teaching, at the end of his longest message, the message, by the way, starts in chapter 5 of Matthew. Look in chapter 7 in verse 13. It's his longest message. And look what Jesus says at the end of it about knowing and following him. In Matthew 7, 13, remember, this is a public message directed at Christ's disciples. It starts out, he, he's talking to his disciples and everybody else is listening. Because Matthew is all about how to be a disciple maker and to be a disciple maker, you have to know who a disciple is. See, that's very vital. I think we've even lost that in modern Christendom. It's like there are many kinds of disciples. No, there's only one type of disciple. The ones that know, hear, and follow Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 13. Jesus said this, Enter by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by that gate, because, verse 14, narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and few who find it. Beware of false prophets, verse 15. They come to you in sheep's clothing, and inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruit. Do you gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Therefore, by your fruits you will know them. I mean, do you get the mat? He's saying... You will know by what comes out of someone's life what they are. Are they good or bad? Now, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Not everybody who prays the prayer. We could put that in 21st century terms. Not everybody who makes a decision. Not everybody who joins the church. Not everybody who, who gets baptized shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, then who will, Lord? Look at verse 21 continues but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Those who know Christ because they've heard his voice and they follow him. Notice what it says, do the will of my Father in heaven. We are born with our own will. We want our own way. We're, we're like wandering sheep where everybody's going their own way. And when we get saved, we hear his voice, we respond to him as our shepherd, and we start following him. That's what salvation is. It's not being inside of a building. It's not having your name on a roll. It's not saying 30 years ago, I, I did that, I prayed that. Do you know him and follow his will? Now, now he gets, I mean, you talk about scaring people. Look at verse 22. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders? We were involved. We spent our whole lives attached to to the rescue station. And I will declare to them, 
I never knew you. He didn't say liar. He didn't say you weren't in church all your life. He didn't say that you did all those wonderful things in his name. He says, yeah, but I never knew you. But here's how you know if you know him. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's parallel with doing the will of my Father. See, see the parallel is that lost people do their own will, which is law, not God's will. It's, it's lawlessness. But saved people know and follow and obey God. And it's a miracle. We humanly can't do that. And so Jesus goes on to say, and I will declare to them in verse 23, I never knew you. So basically what he's saying is disciples know and follow Jesus Christ. That's why the early church is called the disciples. It's not just the 11, the original 12, then the 11, then the Adam Matthias. It's not just those. All the way through the book of Acts, all the way through chapter 21, verse 16, Christians are called disciples. When Paul went on all his missionary journeys, he went and made disciples and trained and led people to becoming obedient followers of Christ, disciples. That's what a Christian is, a disciple. And a disciple knows and follows Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to 1 Timothy 4, because I want to see how we even got to where we are today. 1 Timothy 4, by the way, that's, that's our, our series. And this whole section of 1 Timothy 4 is predicated on this truth we've, we've been looking at this morning. Because we are Christ's disciples, this is what we desire to do. We want to train ourselves in what a disciple is to be. And Paul is teaching Timothy. I mean, see, the whole Christian life is showing and telling. You, you tell them the truth of God, but you show them by your life. You show them how to do it. You tell them what God says, the command, but you teach them by example how to do it. So Paul is telling Timothy, because we're Christ's disciples, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 6, we discipline ourselves in truth. What does that mean? Our source is God's word. Our source of truth is God's word. His word of truth is what we found salvation through. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. Receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. You understand that the scriptures are the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is contained in the word of God. It's a declaration of the truth of God. And we know God through his word. And so the first discipline is the discipline of truth. We realize our source in God's word is our source of truth. That leads us to the discipline of devotion. We love God's word. And the more we spend time in it, it feeds us. That's what, that, that was the whole connected to the cord, making sure you're connected to God. When, when you open the Bible, I mean, people have mindlessly read the Bibles for centuries, for thousands of years, actually, since Moses first wrote it 3,500 years ago. People have been reading it and not going to heaven. You just can't read it. You have to read it connected. It has to be connected to God. Your and my soul connects to God by faith. And all of a sudden, the Bible feeds us. It charges us. The discipline of devotion is we love God's word and it feeds us. And that leads us to, thirdly, the discipline of time. We begin to invest our lives in eternal things, not worthless things. All of a sudden, we start seeing things as profane and empty and, and godless, and they're not really worth wasting life on. That's what the discipline of time is about. And then, as that continues, that leads us to the discipline of integrity we saw last time, where we actually personally pursue godliness. We start seeing parts of our life. It's kind of like you go through a museum and they have the black light section, you know, where, where they're, they're showing, you know, where your white shirt just glows and they're showing all those rocks. They have all those pretty colors. And all of a sudden you look at your clothes and what you couldn't see in normal light, you see all the lint. I remember I used to go through the museum just to pick off. You know, I'd stand in there and just go like this, you know. You get, you get in bright enough light, you can see stuff that needs to go. Did you know that's what happens with this? James says that, that we look in the perfect law of liberty, and, and which is how he describes the word of God, and we see ourselves and we see what needs to be changed. And that's why every time we're in the word and we're connected to God, he changes us. Because what we say is, I don't want that in my life. I don't want that. That doesn't please you. I didn't know about that. Oh, and we're growing in Christ's likeness, which leads us to 
the discipline of disciple making, as soon as we come to that point where we're growing, we explain to others what knowing and following Jesus is all about. You know, you know, we have mystified the process of discipleship so much that people think if you haven't taken three courses and have five books and have 47 things and you never get through the list. Do you know what discipleship is? What did Jesus teach his disciples how to do? I mean, you can see it right in Matthew. He teaches them to feed on the word of God. He teaches them to pray. They want, they're coming to him and say, teach us how to pray. He teaches them about how they're supposed to overcome the evil one, you know, watch out for the devil. And then he tells them how they're supposed to share the gospel. You see, it's so simple. We've made it mystifying. You go to someone, you, you, you explain to them the gospel, and you make sure they're saved. That's usually my first lesson. When I disciple someone, I go through the gospel, and I say, here, this is what you need to lead someone to Christ. Do you know how many times I've done that, and people have turned to me, and they've said, after the whole session, they go, well, I, I couldn't share that with them. That hasn't happened to me. I knew it hadn't. I could tell. They didn't know. And they all of a sudden realized they were not saved. So you go through the word of God, point of salvation. Once, once you're sure they're saved, then you show them how to get something out of the Bible. Have you ever read the Bible and, and received a truth that has just burned in your heart? If that's happened to you, you explain to others how you did that. That's how to read the Bible. Have you ever prayed? You know, I'm discipling someone. I'm teaching them how to pray. The first time we met, I says, okay, I'm going to have you close in prayer. They said, I don't pray out loud. I said, well, you're going to pray out loud. You've heard this story over and over again. Well, months have gone by, and I recently met with them, and I said, okay, that's the uh, last of our session. They said, you're not going to ask me to pray? Because, you see, they'd been practicing. They wanted to pray out loud. Do you see, we're supposed to explain to others. It's not rocket science. It's not nuclear physics. It's not understanding something that is incomprehensible. It's us saying, this is how you read the Bible. This is how I read the Bible. And I, I'm going to explain to you how to read the Bible. This is how you pray. This is how I pray. Let's learn how to pray. This is how you lead someone to Christ. I, this is how I lead someone to Christ. This is how you memorize Scripture. This is how I memorize Scripture. These are the verses I've learned. This is how, and you just, you just explain. And, and you come to the end as soon as they know how to do it. Their last assignment is, now find someone and go do this with them. Did you know that's what every, if, if you are sitting in this pew and saved, this is what every one of us in this room are going to stand in front of God and hear him ask us whether we did on earth what he left us to do. Making disciples. Can you this morning put your finger on parts of your life that are attached to making disciples of Jesus Christ. If not, you're not doing what he left us to do on earth. It's very sobering to think about. A disciple is someone who knows and follows Jesus Christ. So discipleship is teaching someone how to know and follow Jesus Christ. And it's teaching them that God, by his grace, wants to master every area of our life and make our lives pleasing in his sight. We sit with them and say, this is, I mean, the Lord has convicted me here. He's changing me there. He's, he's working in my heart in this area. And that's how we're supposed to train tomorrow's godly men and women. Did you know that the Bible says that, that Christianity is all about personal face-to-face -face training? Paul can compared himself to a nursing mother. Have you ever seen a mother nurse a child from afar? I mean, the child has to be quite close to her. You know, it, it is very much, Paul said, I am nurturing you up close. I am to you like a, a father and a nursing mother. I am closely involved in face-to-face -face training. Now, Jesus, if you study the Gospels, there are 17 big crowd ministries Jesus has that are, that are very clear. He's speaking to vast crowds, 17. There are 46 recorded times when he pulls away from the vast crowds and gets with his small group of disciples. Now, if you add 17 and 46 together and get 63, what you find is it's about one-fifth big crowd and about 80% face to face that's the essence of what the church is about we're supposed to be face to face 
with other people, explaining to them, just as a baby never grows and matures and is considered sick unless they're eating, so any believer that doesn't grow and mature is also sick. So we go to them, we say, we're concerned about your spiritual health. You don't appear to be growing. You, are you sick? In the church, often people are physically well and mature, yet if we could see them spiritually, they're stunted, weak, and underdeveloped and sick. So what was God's plan? Well, if you understand Matthew 28 model, you understand this was the simple discipleship curriculum that everything in life was geared toward making disciples. And so if there's anything we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about where are you reading the Bible and how is the Lord changing you? How are you seeing him in your life? And who do you know in your life that you're going to seek to talk to? And what are you praying about these days? And how are you seeing the word of God change your life? What verses are you memorizing to overcome your fears and anxieties and, and struggles with this or that? And how are you seeing the Lord mortifying this area in your life? And how are you doing it? Did you know that's why the early church was so vibrant? There weren't any spectators there. I mean, it was uncomfortable. If you weren't, in the sh you weren't interested in going to those services because everybody was coming to you and finding out about your spiritual life, and if you didn't have a spiritual life, you didn't want to be there. Now we've flipped all that around. Do you know what the, the going paradigm for the church is? Make everybody comfortable. Why? So they can all be spectators, not really be involved. Just make sure they give, but don't expect them to do anything else. That's not the New Testament church. Genuine disciples are needed. And the scriptures tell us that perhaps the single greatest weakness we can see in contemporary Christianity is we have millions of supposed members who are not involved at all. I don't mean involved in coming and going from the building. They're not involved in hands-on, face-to-face discipleship. It's not enough to spectate. It's actually being involved in making disciples. To make disciples, you have to get around people, even people you're not comfortable with. You know, I met someone very interesting this morning. Someone ran up to me in first service and said, I want you to meet someone. I said, I, I want to meet them, whoever they are. They said, well, three weeks in a row, we've been driving here to church and we've seen them. Three weeks walking to the building. So we pulled over the third week, and said, what, are you coming to Calvary? And they go, yeah. They said, oh, where did you walk from? They said, oh, Gull Road, over by the old Pfizer farms. They said, how long does it take to get over here? They said, two hours. Wow. You know what they did? Instead of rolling the window up and driving on, they said, jump in. We'll take you the last 40 feet. Do you need a ride next week? Do you mind if we don't come two hours for the service? You know, it gets faster in our car. And they are investing their life in someone they saw who is completely different than them. I can tell you that. I met both of them. Someone that we would not all be totally comfortable with. But they are given to face-to-face -face making of disciples because they've read their job description. As soon as we recognize Christ's intentions to make his church a company that is outgoing to the world, we will understand that once the conventional arrangement of the church continues any longer, it will not suffice. There is no chance of accomplishing what Christ desired if 99% of the soldiers are untrained and uninvolved. See, you can measure your involvement by how many people you directly are nurturing in Christ. That's why it's so much to do with the family. I mean, it starts out, are you nurturing your wife? Are you husband and wife building each other up? Are you personally involved in your children's life? You get all practiced up, and as soon as they move on, you just fill them with other people. And you go through life that way. Basically, discipleship is showing and telling. We tell them what God says, we show them how to do it. Hebrews 5 says this, and it's amazing. It says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are so slow to learn. The writer of Hebrews was pointed, wasn't he? In fact, though by this time, you ought to be teaching others. You still need someone to teach you the elementary truths over again. You need milk, not solid food. Solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves. There's that exercise yourself to godliness. See, this is 
this was the heartbeat of the New Testament. The whole New Testament is, is disciple-making focused. Disciples, followers of Christ, were making other followers of Christ. They were dispensing the word of reconciliation. Paul went on to say, this is why I live my life. Galatians 2.20. I was crucified with Christ. When I got saved, I didn't have anything else. It's no longer my life. I now have Christ living in me, and when Christ lives in me, I live for him who loved me and gave himself for me. See, that's what salvation is all about, the exchange life. I exchange my plans and purposes and everything else for his. That's what being crucified with him is all about. So the question is, what on earth do we live for? If in the Gospels Jesus spent all this time training 12 and making them disciples, if the book of Acts is in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to stir everybody up to be going and talking and giving and living for making disciples, if the epistles are all tune-ups in an instruction manual on how to keep this impossible job running smoothly, and if all of us are headed to the results, to a numberless crowd of disciples in heaven surrounding the throne, if that's what it's all about, if you're really in the family, then we need to start focusing our life like the participles focused on the main verb of life, which is making disciples. So that brings us to this question. Are you measuring your life by Christ's standard? Yes, most people, how they're doing, and they think, hmm, I don't feel sick, I still have a job, have money, cars running. What are we measuring life by? All temporary, physical, earthly things. If we measure life by Christ's standard, today we say, I want to personally follow Jesus because that's what a disciple is. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. So if you're saved, that, that is the evidence. And then... Since we know what he wants us to do, we ask ourselves, is my day revolving around his desire to make disciples? Did I start my day kind of like the family that saw the guy walking? They had to have thought and prayed about this. And they come driving up beside him, put the window down, say, are you uh, headed to Calvary? I mean, that was kind of a fearful thing. What if the guy was said, are you kidding, you know, and kicked their car? But a little danger there. But they started their day. They intentionally went driving to look his pathway they'd seen. You see, are you starting the day seeking him? As you go through the day, are you saying, I want ways to serve you? At the end of the day, do you thank him for the opportunities he gave you? Did you know you'll never take someone with you to heaven by leading them to Christ if you're not asking the Lord to give you that opportunity. If you're not arming yourself with the tools you need, a gospel presentation, a gospel track, if you're not intentionally going and and face-to-face talking to people, if the only thing we can take with us to heaven are people we lead to Christ, and we're supposed to do that, why aren't we pointing our life that direction? We never get where we're not pointed in our desires and actions. Believers are disciples who grow every day as a Christ follower, imitating Christ, who did everything, was focused on making disciples, those, those 12. And we become like him in this Christless world. Well, it's time to go. It's 11.43. So let's all stand. And as you stand, I have a, two questions. Number one, Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Not did you pray something 30 years ago. Is Christ alive and and powerfully evident to you today in your life? If not, maybe you need a tune-up on that whole relationship. Maybe you need someone to explain to you again what it means. And at the end of the service, we always have elders and our godly Titus II women of the faith that are up here with their Bibles. And they would love to pull off the side, get in a pew with you, or take you somewhere and go through the gospel. That's number one. Are you a disciple of Christ? Born again, follower of Jesus Christ. If not, today you can cry out to him. There's no incantation. There's no certain words you have to say. It's me crying out to the God who is the living and true God, who is the Savior, who actually came and died for my sins. And I cry out to him. That's number one. Number two, are you making disciples? 
is, is, ever, is the main verb of your life making disciples and every decision and plan where you live, what you do. You know, I have people, I ask them, oh, wh what kind of house are you looking for? I want one on the golf course. I said, oh, you're going to try and win all those people to the Lord? You're trying to make me feel bad about my house? I said, no, I'm trying to ask you if you're living for what you live for. Where are you looking for? On the lake. Oh, are you trying to win all those people in those boats to the Lord? Are you trying to make me feel bad about it? No. Have a house on an island on a golf course in the middle of a lake if you're trying to reach the people for Christ. Otherwise, confess. You're not living for what your job description says. See, we have to be honest. Are you doing what Christ left you and me to do? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that Though this is a place of fellowship and worship and teaching and preaching, those are just to aid the mission. And the mission for every one of us is to make disciples. And I pray that we would seriously begin to sort through our lives and start asking you to turn every part of us that's not facing toward the main verb of our lives, making disciples, to turn it that way, and if it won't turn, to ask you to get rid of that, because we don't want that, because it's hindering why we're here. And I pray more and more we'd see the fervor and focus of the early church, who knew why they were here, and they lived for you, wherever they were in life. May we do that too for your glory. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.